Fred Sweet that was it. <clears throat> Hutchtown, said Fred, as with a slight bump they hit the ground. They had landed next to a tumble-down garage in a small yard, and here he looked out for the first time at Ron's house. It looked as though it had once been a large stone pig pen, but extra rooms had been added here and there until it was several stories high, and so crooked it looked as though it were held up by magic. Which, Harry reminded himself, it probably was. Four or five chimneys were perched on top of the red roof. A lopsided sign stuck in the ground near the entrance read the burrow. Around the front door lay a jumble of rubber boots and a very rusty cauldron. Several fat brown chickens were pecking their way around the yard. It's not much, said Ron. It's wonderful, said Harry happily, thinking of Privet Drive. They got out of the car. Now we'll go upstairs really quietly, said Fred, and wait for Mum to call us for breakfast. Then Ron, you come bounding downstairs going, Mum, look who turned up in the night, and she'll be all pleased to see Harry, and no one need ever know we flew the car. Right, said Ron. Come on, Harry. I sleep at the at the top. Ron had gone a nasty greenish color, his eyes fixed on the house. The other three wheeled around. Mrs. Weasley was marching across the yard, scattering chickens, and for a short, plump, kind-faced woman, it was remarkable how much she looked like a saber-toothed tiger. Ah, said Fred. Oh, dear, said George. Mrs. Weasley came to a halt in front of them, her hands on her hips, staring from one guilty face to the next. She was wearing a flowered apron with a wand sticking out of her pocket. So, she said. Morning, Mum, said George, in what he clearly thought was a jaunty winning voice. Have you any idea how worried I've been, said Mrs. Weasley in a deadly whisper. Um, sorry, Mum, but see, we had to... All three of Mrs. Weasley's sons were taller than she was, but they cowered as her rage broke over them. Bad something? No notes? Car gone? Could have crashed? Out of my mind with worry. Did you care? Never, as long as I've lived. You wait until your father gets home. He never had trouble like this from Bill or Charlie or Percy. Perfect Percy, muttered Fred. You could do with taking a leaf out of Percy's book, yelled Mrs. Weasley, prodding a finger in Fred's chest. You could have died. You could have been seen. You could have lost your father his job. It seemed to go on for hours. Mrs. Weasley had shouted herself hoarse before she turned on Harry, who backed away. I'm very pleased to see you, Harry dear, she said. Come in and have some breakfast. She turned and walked back into the house, and Harry, after a nervous glance at Ron, who nodded encouragingly, followed her. The kitchen was small and rather prim. There was a scrubbed wooden table and chairs in the middle, and Harry sat down on the edge of the seat, looking around. He had never been in a wizard house before. The clock on the wall opposite him had only one hand and no numbers at all. Written around the edge were things like time to make tea, time to feed the chickens, and you're late. Books were stacked three deep on the mantelpiece, books with titles like Charm Your Own Cheese, Enchantment and Baking, and One Minute Feast, It's Magic. And unless Harry's ears were deceiving him, the old radio next to the sink had just announced that coming up was Witching Hour, with the popular singing sorceress Celestina Warbeck. Mrs. Weasley was clattering around, cooking breakfast a little haphazardly, throwing dirty looks at her sons as she threw sausages into the frying pan. Every now and then, she muttered things like, Don't know what you were thinking of, and never would have believed it. I don't blame you, dear, she assured Harry, tipping eight or nine sausages into his plate. Arthur and I have been worried about you, too. Just not last night, we were saying we'd come and get you ourselves if you hadn't written back to Ron by Friday. But really, she was now adding three fried eggs to his plate. Flying an illegal car halfway across the country, anyone could have seen you. She flipped her wand casually at the dishes in the sink, which began to clean themselves, thinking gently in the background. It is cloudy, Mum, said Fred. You keep your mouth closed while you're eating, Mrs. Weasley snapped. They were starving him, Mum, said George, and you, said Mrs. Weasley. But it was with a slightly softened expression that she started cutting Harry bread and buttering it for him. At that moment, there was a diversion in the form of a small, red-headed figure in a long nightdress who appeared in the kitchen, gave a small squeal, and ran out again. Ginny, said Ron in an undertone to Harry, my sister. She's been talking about you all summer. Yeah, she'll be wanting your autograph, Harry, Fred said with a grin, but he caught his mother's eye and bent his face over his plate without another word. Nothing more was said until all four plates were clean, which took a surprisingly short time. Blimey, I'm tired, yawned Fred, setting down his knife and fork at last. I think I'll go to bed and... You will not, snapped Mrs. Weasley. It's your own fault you've been up all night. You are going to denome the garden for me. You're getting completely out of hand again. Oh, Mom. 
And you too, she said, glaring at Ron and George. You can go up to bed, dear, she added to Harry. You didn't ask them to fly that wretched car. But Harry, who felt wide awake, said he could quickly, I'll help Ron. I've never seen a demon me. That's very sweet of you, dear, but it's dull work, said Mrs. Weasley. Now let's see what Lockhart's got to say on the subject. And she pulled a heavy book from the stack on the mantelpiece. George groaned. Mom, we know how to do a garden. Harry looked at the cover of Mrs. Weasley's book. Written across it in fancy gold letters were the words, Gilderoy Lockhart's Guide to Household Tests. There was a big photograph on the front of a very good-looking wizard with wavy blonde hair and bright blue eyes. As always in the wizarding world, the photograph was moving. The wizard, who Harry supposed was Gilderoy Lockhart, kept winking cheekily up at them all, Mrs. Weasley being down at him. Oh, he is marvelous. She said, he knows his household tests. Tests, all right. It's a wonderful book. Mum fancies him, said Fred, and in a very audible whisper. Don't be so ridiculous, Fred, said Mrs. Weasley, her cheeks rather pink. All right, if you think you know better than Lockhart, you can go on and get, get on with it. And we'll be tied to if there's a single gnome in that garden when I come out to inspect it. Yawning and grumbling, the Weasleys slouched outside with Harry behind them. The garden was large, and in Harry's eyes, exactly what a garden should be. The Dursleys wouldn't have liked it. There were plenty of weeds, and the grass needed cutting, but there were gnarled trees all around the walls. Plants Harry had never seen spilling from every flower bed, and a big green pond full of frogs. Muggles have garden gnomes too, you know, Harry told Ron as they crossed the lawn. Yeah, I've seen those things. They think are gnomes, said Ron, bent double with his head in a peony bush, like fat little Santa Clauses, with fishing rods. There was a violent scuffling noise, the peony bush shuddered, and Ron straightened up. This is a gnome, he said grimly. Groff me, groff me, squealed the gnome. It was certainly nothing like Santa Claus. It was small and leathery looking, with a large, nubby, knobby, bald head, exactly like a potato. Ron held it at arm's length as it kicked out at him with its horny little feet. He grasped it around the ankles and turned it upside down. This is what you have to do, he said. He raised the gnome above his head, groff me, and started to swing it in great circles, like a lasso. Seeing the shocked look on Harry's face, Ron added, it doesn't hurt them. You've just got to make them really dizzy so they can't find their way back to the gnome hills. He let go of the gnome's ankles. It flew twenty feet into the air and landed with a thud in the field over the ledge. <clears throat> Pitiful, said Fred. I bet I can get mine beyond that stump. Harry learned quickly not to feel too sorry for the gnomes. He decided just to drop the first one he caught over the hedge, but the gnome, sensing weakness, sank its razor-sharp teeth into Harry's finger and he had a hard job shaking it off until... Wow, Harry, that must have been fifty feet. The, the air was soon thick with flying gnomes. See, they're not too bright, said George, seizing five or six gnomes at once. The moment they know the denoming's going on, they storm up to have a look. You'd think they'd learn by now just to stay put. Soon, the crowd of gnomes in the field started walking away in a straggling line, their little shoulders hunched. They'll be back, said Ron, as they watched the gnomes disappear into the hedge on the other side of the field. They love it here. Dad's too soft with them. He thinks they're funny. Just then, the front door slammed. He's back, said George. Dad's home. They hurried through the garden and back into the house. Mrs. Weasley was slumped in a kitchen chair with his gla- Mr. Weasley was slumped in a kitchen chair with his glasses off and his eyes closed. He was a thin man, going bald, but the little hair he had was as red as any of his children's. He was wearing long green robes, which were dusty and travel-worn. What a night, he mumbled, groping for the teapot as they all sat down around him. Nine raids. Nine. And old Mundungus Fletcher tried to put a hex on me when I had my back turned. Mr. Weasley took a long gulp of tea and sighed. Find anything, Fred? Dad, said Fred eagerly. All I got were a few shrinking door keys and a biting kettle, yawned Mr. Weasley. There was some pretty nasty stuff that wasn't my department, though. Mortlake was taken away for questioning about some extremely odd ferrets, but that's the Committee on Experimental Charms, thank goodness. Why would anyone bother making door keys shrink, said George. Just muggle-baiting, sighed Mr. Weasley. Sell them a key that keeps shrinking to nothing so they can never find it when they need it. Of course, it's very hard to convict anyone because no muggle would admit their key keeps shrinking. They'll insist they just keep losing it. Bless them. They'll go to any lengths to ignore magic, even if it's staring them in the face. But the things are a lot of tricking to enchant, and you wouldn't believe. Like cars, for instance? Mrs. Weasley had appeared, holding a long poker like a sword. Mr. Weasley's eyes jerked open. He stared guiltily at his wife. Cars, Molly dear? Yes, Arthur, cars, said Mrs. Weasley, her eyes flashing. Imagine a wizard buying a rusty old car and telling his wife all he wanted to do with it was take it apart to see how it works. Well, really, he was enchanting it to make it fly. Mr. Weasley blinked. Oh, well, dear, <clears throat> I think you'll find that he would be quite within the law to do that, even if er, he maybe would have done better to him tell his wife the truth. There's a loophole in the law. You'll find, as long as he wasn't intending to fly the car, the fact that the car could fly wouldn't... 
Arthur Weasley, you made sure there was a loophole when you wrote that law, shouted Mrs. Weasley. Just so you could carry on tinkering with all that mu muggle rubbish in your shed. And for your information, Harry arrived this morning in that car you were not intending to fly. Harry, said Mr. Weasley blankly. Harry who? He looked around, saw Harry, and jumped. Good Lord, is it Harry Potter? Very pleased to meet you. Ron's told us so much about your sons flew that car to Harry's house and back last night, shouted Mrs. Weasley. What have you got to say about that, eh? Did you really, said Mr. Weasley eagerly. Did it go all right? I, I mean, he faltered as sparks flew from Mrs. Weasley's eyes. That, that was very wrong, boys. Very wrong indeed. Let's leave them to it, Ron muttered to Harry as Mrs. Weasley swelled like a bullfrog. Come on, I'll show you my bedroom. They slipped out of the kitchen and down a narrow passageway to an uneven staircase, which wound its way, zigzagging up through the house. On the third landing, a door stood ajar. Harry just caught sight of a pair of bright brown eyes staring at him before it closed with a snap. Ginny, said Ron, you don't know how weird it is for her to be this shy. She never shuts up normally. They climbed two more flights until they reached a door with ceiling paint and a small plaque on it saying Ronald's room. Harry stepped in, his head almost touching the sloping ceiling, and blinked. It was like walking into a furnace. Nearly everything in Ron's room seemed to be a violent shade of orange, the bedspread, the walls, even the ceiling. Then Harry realized that Ron had covered nearly every inch of the shabby wallpaper with posters of the same seven witches and wizards, all wearing bright orange robes, carrying broomsticks, and waving energetically. Your Quidditch team, said Harry. The Chudley Cannon, said Ron, pointing at the orange bedspread, which was emblazoned with two giant black C's and a speeding cannonball, ninth in the league. Ron's school spellbook was stacked untidily in a corner, next to a pile of comics that all seemed to feature the adventures of Martin Miggs, the Mad Muggle. Ron's magic wand was lying on top of a fish tank full of frog spawn on the windowsill, next to his fat gray rat, Gabbard, who was snoozing in a patch of sun. Harry stepped over a pack of self-shuffling playing cards on the floor and looked out of the tiny window. In the field far below, he could see a gang of gnomes sneaking one by one back to the Weasley's hedge. Then he turned to look at Ron, who was watching him almost nervously, as though waiting for his opinion. It's a bit small, said Ron quickly. Not like that room you had with the muggles, and I'm right underneath the ghoul in the attic. He's always banging on the pipes and groaning. But Harry, grinning widely, said, This is the best house I've ever been in. Ron's ears went pink.